Oh, boy. Oh, For those boy. who don't know, that's the signal that Commonwealth Club programs are starting. Mm. I'm Gloria Duffy, and I'm so happy to welcome you this evening for a conversation with two wonderful people. Uh, Jerry Brown, former governor of California, and Gust Brown, businesswoman and former uh, first lady of California. Now, I'm not going to do a traditional introduction because is there anybody here who doesn't know who <laughs> Jerry Brown and <laughs> Ann Gust Brown are? So we won't take the time to do that. Uh, these are folks who always focus on cutting to the core of the topic and the material. And so that's just what we're going to do tonight. Not waste time on um, details and uh, pleasantries, although it's going to be very pleasant. <laughs> so um, let's start by asking you both. Two months out of public office, how's, how's it feeling? Uh, actually, it feels the same. <laughs> For you, yeah. For me, I know. Yeah. yeah. I don't sweat. You, the, I don't sweat the details. You don't sweat the I details. I spend a lot so. of time thinking about big ideas. Yeah. I talk to people. I do stuff. So what's the difference? <laughs> I mean, governor, when you have to sign and veto bills, that's an issue. Every week we have to. I had to look at uh, 25 life for paroles. That's something. Uh, but uh, I approach the job, uh, I think, in a, in a somewhat original way. Uh, always looking for what needed, what could be done that could be done because I was there, but nobody else. So I was always looking not to the flow of the ordinary activity, which will take place whether I'm there or not, but what kinds of intervention could I make? And so now I'm not doing that, but um, I'm still, in my own mind, kind of running things. <laughs> How about That's you, Anne? How, yeah. has, how has life changed in the well, last couple months? It, 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 it was a shock to leave office. Uh, and Jerry, he's right, he doesn't sweat the details, so it wasn't so shocking to him. Uh, but for me, you know, we had to get a car. We had been driven around for eight years. We didn't have a car anymore. I had to figure out, you know, how to move everything. He paid no attention to all of <laughs> the millions of boxes of, of papers and books, and he's still paying no attention to them. They're still at the house. So uh, all of the details of getting out of office, no longer having CHP protection, who is with you all the time, all of, and, and just the shock of, you were so immersed in something for eight years in a, a group of people, and then just one day you leave and it's gone. So it's it's it was very abrupt, uh, a bit shocking. It, it took me, and then to go to a ranch, you know, you couldn't go to something more extreme. We were in the hubbub, and then we're off with some cows and coyotes. <laughs> uh, so. I found it shocking, but he's right. He would just be on the phone, and I don't think it shocked you nearly as much as it did me. So, but that, well, I guess that's good. You're very zen or something. I, or maybe you don't realize you're not governor anymore. I don't know. Yeah. I, could be. So we're going to go back and talk about your long political service, your... Uh, various roles, the history of your family, many other things. But I was struck in studying up on your recent lives by how the two of you were a team when you were governor and you were the first lady. Could you both talk a little bit about how you divided up responsibilities, and especially Anne, how were you involved in the governance of the state through your relationship with Jerry? Well, when Jerry and I had dated uh, for 15 years before we got married. He, he's into doing his due diligence. So um, we dated a long time. And uh, as many of you maybe know, I had a career. I was a lawyer. I was an executive at The Gap. I had a lot going on in my own life. Uh, but when we decided to get married, uh, Jerry, we also decided I'd be leaving The Gap and that I would run his uh, campaign for attorney general at that point which was kind of crazy on a number of levels because I've never run a political campaign in my life. And, you know, it is Willie Brown, who was here tonight, you know, said, this is crazy, Ann. You know, you don't become the campaign manager for your husband because, you know, when the stuff goes wrong on the campaign, you want to 
you know, the first person you blame is the manager, and then when that's your wife, it's complicated. So, um, and it does, it's not good for a marriage and all that sort of stuff. So uh, it was a lot of change for me and for the both of us, because we went from sort of being a couple but having our own lives like normal people do, uh, to you know, completely me leaving a job, uh, starting something completely different, and getting married. <laughs> That was something, too. Um, <laughs> so in any event, it worked a lot better than I thought. I did have trepidation about it, uh, to be together 24 hours a day and doing something difficult, like running a campaign. Uh, but it really did work well. And um, I think we really different, have different strengths. Jerry leaves me to doing all the detail stuff. He's more the visionary, so we sort of keep in our own lanes. And, uh, and then when he became attorney general, because I had managed a legal department before and, and had a lot of legal management and otherwise experience, I think I could fit into that role and in helping him really well. Uh, so I think that went smoothly. But what do you, what do you think? Well, <laughs> well, first of all, you were working because you never ran a campaign, but I've been doing nothing but campaigns. So. Correct. I knew, I knew about the politics, you knew how to run things, so put the two together, it worked very well. In the Attorney General's office, um, you know, the, a lot of people want to bring in all their political friends and cronies and managers and what have you, but uh, the way we did it was the, there was one fellow, uh, Jim Humes, uh, who Ann and I got to know and interviewed, and we made him uh, the head of the entire office. Uh, later, I made him a court of appeals judge. He's quite, quite skilled and uh, very well regarded. But anyway, the whole office ran with professional lawyers that were already there. And any kind of political input, I could provide. And uh, in legal matters, for example, in the countrywide case, uh, the office wasn't being very aggressive at all on the bank fraud. And then got uh, right into that <clears throat> and made sure that before the statute of limitations uh, expired, that the Attorney General of California had brought the proper action. But the point being, an office with thousands of people uh, was run by the people who know best, the civil servants, and then just the two of us, with a handful of other people that we, we uh, were able to bring. And that fits in with my general view, is if you have very skilled people who know what they're doing, you don't need too many of them. If you don't, you have a lot of people and then you know, just go around in circles. So that worked very well. And then the governor's office and helped me find some of the key players. Uh, she was in, uh, oversaw uh, human relations uh, at human resources, rather, at the Gap. And so we got some very skilled people, and that worked very well, too. So, and the amazing thing was, because uh, I, I know Hillary got in a little trouble in Bill's White House and other wives have gotten into trouble, uh, but because people were always a little concerned about how I handled things, um, surprisingly or chaotically or whatever you want to call it. Uh, people were very relieved that an orderly <laughs> manager was on the premises. So no one dared complain because the only alternative was me. So, so actually it worked like a charm. And Anne, you'd been chief administrative officer of the Gap, so you knew, you knew how to make things run well. Correct, correct, I did. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, I focus on getting the people in, managing, getting the trains to run on time, those sorts of things. And Jerry is m more the visionary. And, and uh, like you said, he has a very chaotic style, as anyone who's worked for him would know. He, he can, meetings with you can last hours and hours, if not days, and uh, he just pulls in what's on his mind and whatever. So someone needs to keep all of these things in, in mind and manage it uh, to an extent, and that's, that's always been more my skill. So, uh, but I don't have the vision that you I do. I would, well, you have a lot of vision. <laughs> uh, but I would say that government, the governor's office, is not about management. There is an element of management, but it's more, first of all, Number one thing is avoiding scandal and screw-ups. That's number one. Because whatever you do, if you tend to do good things, but you have one big boo-boo, that's what people remember. So being able to look over the landscape and see trouble and stop it before it becomes trouble is very important. And then the other positive uh, aspect is what do you do? Uh, what's important? 
And uh, for me, things like the budget. Well, if you have a $27 billion deficit, it's pretty important that you do something about it. And we did. We got rid of it. So we didn't have to think a lot. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> the problems showed up. And so we just had, we had to think about how you pay it off and how you raise the taxes and cut programs and work with the legislature. And I had to veto their budget once just to keep everything in line. Uh, so there are skills and there are tactics and there are maneuvers. Uh, but basically, it's avoiding the big screw ups, getting very good people and finding out what is wanted and needed and then doing it. And what was wanted and needed was put the, uh, the fiscal house in order and then pension reform and then uh, infrastructure with adequate gas tax funding and uh, workers' comp reform and water bond and rainy day fund and uh, new formula for schools so that they got 30% more money based on the lower income families. So you get a few ideas, uh, you make them work, and you do it in that framework. So I think we had the management, we had the, whatever the political um, component of that was, and as far as I know, it worked pretty good, so <laughs> I have no complaints. Uh, okay. the, there was one little, a little oh, factor. Please. Oh, no. One little factor, not a factor, a huge factor. From the day I took office, the recovery was already a year in, in going, by the way they, they chart the beginning of these recoveries. And from the first moment to the day I left and turned the lights out, California was growing year, month by month, always. Still growing, for that matter. So that was a night. People feel good. So I, by the way, I had nothing to do with that. That's <laughs> co called the global economy. I helped avoid some screw-ups and fix the budget deficit and avoided a lot of crazy bills by vetoing them and a few <laughs> other things and stopping them um, by cajoling the legislature and all. But ba basically, though, it's nice when things are going well because a lot of polling... When the economy is doing well, they feel better about the executive, the leader, the president, or the governor. When things get bad, then it's, it really takes skill to keep um, your popularity up. So we, we had that nice upward trajectory, which hasn't happened very often in California, maybe one other time. So uh, you left the state in remarkably good shape financially which was also the case at the end of your first set of terms. Was that also a coincidence? Well, we had a little baby deficit. Uh, they thought it was a billion and a half, turned out to be a billion, which <laughs> for government work is really nothing. That's a, the but, first time you mean? Yeah, the first a time. A little bit. Yeah, no. But it, it was the, we had a big recession. I mean, that was the, Reagan was elected in 80. There was a big recession. Uh, the uh, Federal Reserve jacked up the interest rates. Unemployment went to, uh, I don't know, 10%. Um, so when I left, we, we did have a little but shortage of funds. But let's be clear, you are a very frugal man, well, to we put got it mildly. <laughs> and, uh, By 19, you, seven, in June of 78, we had a surplus uh, between 5 and $6 billion on a $24 billion budget. So that's pretty good. But on the other hand, Howard Jarvis came along and said, Brown's been scoring all that money away. We're going to take it back and give it to the hard-pressed property owner. So, you know, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. If you spend all the money, that's a problem. If you save all the money, that's another problem. So this is not for amateurs. <laughs> <laughs> well, with all the t your time in public service, one could not say that you're an amateur. That's for sure. No, not after all these years. <laughs> so back on the personal again for a moment. And we'll, of course, get into the many policy and political issues. Um, you, Jerry, did not marry until your 60s. And I believe... 67, to be 67. exact. 67. And you... I won't tell you how old Dan was, though. Okay. Uh, well, I, I won't get into that. <laughs> but um, I, I've read some quotes from you in which you said that um, you were so dedicated to politics and making things happen that you didn't... Think, feel you had time for a marriage, but that if the two could be merged into a marriage and a, a policy and political partnership, that could work. No. No? No? You, you didn't say that? or No. Oh. no well, I, first of all, I never <laughs> met anyone like Ann before. Uh, and no, I, I did. Uh, <laughs> so, and everyone's so smart, 
so flexible and so loving and so fun to be with. <laughs> so had I met someone like that before, I probably would have gotten married, but I didn't. So I looked around a lot. <laughs> <laughs> He did. Uh, he did. Mm -hmm. so, I, I keep finding, even now, after all these years together, and how many years have we been together? Uh, since a long time. A long since time. 1990. Since 1990. We still <laughs> will meet someone, and it's an old girlfriend. And I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know about Rosemary or whatever. I mean, you still, it's crazy. Yeah, crazy. You did look around a lot. <laughs> Any, any particular issue on which you worked very effectively together and where you could cite the, the roles that you played as having a big impact on the success of the policy or legislation? Well, raising the money. There was so many of these things. I mean, I think it started, for us, the toughest was the uh, campaign for governor against Meg Whitman, where we were out, she spent close to 200 million, and we had about 30, Five million to spend, and so, and it was essentially, you know, we had a very lean team, mostly me and Jerry, and you know, a couple paid people, and uh, and a lot of uh, some volunteers. But we had to work on that 24/7, and uh, so that was, I think, very collaborative. And uh, I, I mean, we just, we had to be on the same sheet about everything, but. Coming in and dealing with the budget deficit was really uh, an enormous thing in the Prop 30 that uh, the tax increase we did to avoid further cuts to the schools. Uh, uh, I think we worked really well. Uh, I had to run a lot of the campaign for that. Uh, again, because once it, it was a once it became a campaign, you couldn't really sit and do it in the governor's office. So I needed to you know, go back to our house and uh, run a campaign separately from being in the governor's office and, but dealing with you all the time on it. So I, I don't think there's any issue that we haven't worked together pretty well on. Uh, even when we disagree, uh, which we would disagree at times, and uh, I remember oftentimes in, in the governor's office an issue would come up, I'd feel we should do this, Another staff person would feel we should do that, and Jerry would listen to both of us. Sometimes he'd agree with me, sometimes not. He'd go with the other person, but there was always very open dialogue, because it wasn't about me, him picking me being right. It was about whatever was right. I will say, right. Anne, uh, when I was trying to think about going forward on the high-speed rail, she was a big promoter of that. So this That's is something true. we need yeah. to have. Yeah, yeah. And we did it. So... Um, there's been a lot of discussion, Jerry, about your values and your philosophy, your time as a seminarian, uh, your study of Buddhism. Can you talk a little bit about the values that have driven you in public life? Well, I don't look at it as values. You know, values, I think of true value hardware or something. But, uh, <laughs> values is a mercantile term. And, uh, going to the seminary is not a mercantile experience, or pr practicing Zen meditation is, uh, I don't get the value language doesn't quite capture it. Um, but I, what drew me, I'm very interested in kind of large issues, and certainly the pursuit of uh, the, uh, the priesthood, the Jesuit uh, formation, uh, all that is entailed by that, is a very big idea. It's very different. It's all about ultimate things, ultimate matters. In fact, they, they describe it as the practice of perfection, which I can tell you after having done it for a while, you don't get very per perfect. So there's a gap uh, somewhere. Uh, but uh, in Zen is based on uh, no images. So when you're uh, doing Zazen, you're sitting on your cushion following your breathing. There's the whole idea is to concentrate and, and be there without getting, uh, following all the little ideas that go through your brain. So I don't know what you would call that. More in the, the quest for how to live. What, 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 is our, what are our lives about? And how do you want to live them? So that's why I feel what I'm doing now isn't all that much different than what I've always done, which is to find uh, a path uh, to follow uh, whether, and see where, where it goes and, and opening up the possibilities of what life might uh, hold and what possibilities uh, I discover in myself. So that's the way I would describe 
those two, those two practices. And um, there's similarities. Buddhism and Christianity are, are different. But it's interesting in one of the basic, um, the basic foundation of the Jesuit uh, spiritual exercises is um, uh, overcoming what they call inordinate attachments uh, so that the mind is free of bias and can be open to the, um, to the, the movements of the Holy Spirit. Now you get to Buddhism and they talk about uh, attachment and non-attachment. And one of the things that they say uh, when you're in a Buddhist retreat or a Buddhist monastery, one of, the, one of the vows you recite is, illusions are endless. I vow to cut them down. So th that's something that, um, A, I think it's true. B, it doesn't just reply to the spiritual life. It's true of the intellectual life or one's life in general. So I've been pursuing these things, and I don't know where it all started. My grandmother, uh, Ida, uh, who was born at the very place where we now live, uh, the mountain house, uh, would read to me Bible stories. And I was very interested in the pictures of Moses and the Red Sea and, and uh, the bulrushes and Sodom and Gomorrah and all that kind of stuff. So I always felt that that biblical world was more interesting than the regular world. So I've always had that kind of quest, see if I can't get in touch with that more... Um, uh, invisible part of uh, what existence is. So, Anne, you're from the Midwest. You're from a family that was also a little bit involved in politics. Tell Correct. us about your background and your values. Well, yeah, I came from the Midwest from a Republican family. Uh, my father was involved in politics. Uh, he ran for lieutenant governor with uh, uh, George Romney, Mitt Romney's father. He did not win. Um, this is in Michigan. In Michigan, yes. And um, so I had Jerry's experience. I still see the little flyers of me as a five-year-old and, you know, Rocky Gus, the man you can trust, and I'm sitting there, you know, and uh, <laughs> using the family as a prop. So we were involved a lot in, in politics. Uh, and so we grew up in a, a pretty wealthy suburb of Detroit, but on a, a 10 acre farm called Thimble Farm. Uh, we didn't actually have animals and we weren't really farmers, but we had land and you know we did grow corn and things like that. Uh, so I love that part I, of, of growing up, uh, of being out in the open. Um, same, not Catholic, we were Presbyterian, but very Christian values. Uh, I had never had quite the pursuit that Jerry had, because it it's always was amazing to me that at such a young age, he wanted to go be a priest. His parents did not want him to. They, his mother cried. Um, they wouldn't let him for a while. Uh, but to be that young and to want to do something like that where he wanted to explore in this other universe or this other part. Dimension. Dimension, yeah. And to seek perfection. Uh, you know, he, w he was a more substantive sort of teenager than I was. Uh, in the Midwest, we were drinking six packs and things like that. So um, I don't <coughs> think I had that same sort of, I went to Stanford, fell in love with California. I think, uh, Jerry and I do have common sort of Christian values, such as they are, but I don't think either of us thinks of it in that way. Uh, I don't think we sit there and say, oh, our vet. we tend to agree on anything important uh, morally, uh, and I think that's important. I've, I've always wondered how these political couples were, one's way on the right and one's on the left, and how that actually works, because uh, I wouldn't find that appealing. And we don't have that problem. And I, I can't think of any big issue that we disagree on. So, Sometimes when I'm doing the life of paroles with Anne, she takes a little more jaundiced view of men who kill their wives. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, Jerry literally has said things like, well, maybe she deserved it or something. You know? no, I, no, I didn't say and that. And I've always said, no, you know, I, if I end up dead, clear. maybe you should watch. I can watch. see that after the guy's been in prison for 30 years, he can re reform himself. He, can. He's, he might have been 
he might have had a difficult time. So you have to think. <laughs> And, and he really is, he does the right thing. You know, he's, he's got a lot of mercy in his heart, and, uh, and I don't have as much. I, I don't think that's as good, <laughs> necessarily. But, you know, sometimes, uh, yeah, I get a little chilled by the crime in a way. Um, you know, I think you do, too, but you, you have more this notion of redemption, uh, which I think is good. But sometimes we have to balance it, so we fight over that. And You did issue a lot of pardons. I did. How many? I don't know. Well, let me be clear. A pardon is generally given based on rehabilitation, not innocence, although I, I have given a pardon on innocence. And they're given after a person has been out of prison, usually for 10 years, but sometimes uh, a much shorter period, if that's appropriate. And there's also commutations. And I gave uh, over, over 200 commutations, many to those who had life without any possibility of parole, or those who had very long sentences. Um, and that was common. Uh, Ronald Reagan gave over 500 pardons, and Duke Majin gave like about 400. Uh, then it kind of went out of favor, uh, Wilson, Davis, and then a little came back under Duke Majin. But uh, it is a, it is a, one thing, we're in such a different position. In, in the 70s, my first time around, the prisons had 25,000 prisoners. They went to a low of 18,000, a high of maybe 30,000. Well, then it went up to 173,000. So there was a 500% increase. So that meant uh, instead of 10, 12 prisons, all of a sudden we we're up to 35 prisons. So that is a very different reality. And um, if you want to put it in a, just a term, uh, about 150 people are in prison for every 100,000 people. Uh, that was in the 60s and 70s. Then it went up to about 700 in, in America, generally. So there was a big wave of uh, incarceration. Some people call it mass incarceration. So uh, we're trying to deal with that and come to terms with it. And also, I don't, uh, there, there's a lot of times when people, you do something, you, know, you have an act, and then people take that act and they make that who you are. That's your essence. And it is who you are at that moment. But after you've been in jail or prison 25 years, or some cases 40 years or 45 years, there is a process of awareness, of enlightenment, and yes, of redemption. So I think there has to be an element of hope that is always there. And I, I do feel very strongly about that. And I think that when you create a situation where thousands of young men have zero hope, then you create an environment which itself is criminogenic. And gangs flourish, uh, violence, uh, madness. Uh, and for the 95% that are going to come home, uh, that's a very negative environment. So because of all that, I have uh, given more commutations than most. I also signed uh, a number of laws that altered uh, this very long uh, period of incarceration, which between 1920 and in 1978, it had no precedent. So this is all very recent, and it, it, I think it does still call call out for a lot of rethinking. I agree. So you served two sets of terms as yeah. governor. You were not there for the first one. No. Nope. Um, and it raises some questions about timing in politics. Yeah. So I'm old enough to remember your first set of terms and the, the rather far-reaching policies you set out at the time. Uh, solar energy, space satellites, uh, and then you came back to a number of those issues in your second set of terms. And your timing was better to get, the, or the timing was better to get those things done the second time around. So some people see trends and they're prophetic but then they're not able to move things forward because the timing or the understanding of others just isn't right. Um, so first of all, can you comment on what the continuities were between what you tried to do during the first set of terms and the second set of terms? And then how can we change our politics and our society maybe to provide more opportunity for farsighted ideas to be implemented when they're first uh, perceived and, and created? Well, I'd say, first off, that when you talk about how can we change our politics, that's a pretty big statement. 
when you say politics, you mean the entire way America and the West is being governed, and you're going to change that with one person? Uh, we are reacting to events. A depression sets uh, a possible change in attitudes, and going from Hoover to Roosevelt, that, that did uh, allow for change, a new emerging role for uh, the federal government called the New Deal. And then World War II, that created another. So uh, big world events uh, d determine uh, how we show up. And a leader can only work with what, what is there. And the time has to be ripe, or, or you're just bucking the, 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 the tide. It can't be done. So I did have an interest in the environment. The reason I had an interest early in the environment, first of all, this was happening. When my father was governor, I don't even think the word environment existed. Um, uh, it, now we have environment, we have ecology, we have all sorts of those words. So uh, 1970 was Earth Day. That was the, um, the first time that happened, 1970. I was running for Secretary of State. Uh, the Stockholm Conference on the Environment, the global uh, conference, was 1972. Uh, Rachel Carson wrote a book in the late 60s. Uh, so there was a, a, an awareness of, of the environment. The Clean Air Act happened in 1969. The, many of these uh, laws that came to be were happening around that period as the Vietnam War wound down. So it was only natural that I would have an interest, and I did take an interest in the environment. So now coming later, um, because climate change is now such a central challenge, uh, I did uh, take a great deal of interest in that. And California, uh, interesting, which really makes the point that it isn't just one person. Uh, California has more institutional capacity to deal with air pollution or climate than anywhere else probably in the world. And that happened because there was a lot of smog in L.A. Uh, Reagan was governor, uh, Nixon was president, and that smog had just pushed people to the point where we've got to do something. And at the national level, that was the Clean Air Act. At California level, it was the Air Resources Board. When you put those two together, state and federal, um, the exception was granted to California alone that this state could make more stringent auto emission standards because of the unique uh, smog and air pollution we had. We still have uh, non-attainment areas. So because of that, this Air Resources Board was created. And when I came in as governor, I started appointing people. One of the people I appointed early on in 1978, Mary Nichols, is still there. She was the one under Schwarzenegger, and she was there during my eight years. She's still there. So uh, we have a lot of scientists. We have a lot of uh, technicians, policymakers, and people who have been thinking about air pollution, uh, greenhouse gases, climate, methane, uh, you know, soot, uh, all the rest of that stuff. And therefore, because now this is such a global threat, obviously that I would make it a top thing. But it started because the environment to me was not like other issues. A lot of these issues are, it could be this way or it could be that way. But what's the environment is more like a physical law. Uh, you know, you, you, the whole habitat, the species, uh, how the air, the rain, the poison, all that stuff, those are physical laws. And you just can't uh, disobey them uh, with impunity. So you've got to get on the side of nature. You've got to work with nature. And this, to me, had almost, a th it wasn't theological, but it had the same ultimate grounding. This was not something you could fool around with. It's something you had to understand and respond. So I always found the environment along, there's so many things in politics, you can go this way or that way, you know, and politicians do. But on the fundamentals, like our climate, uh, you got to get on the side of science. And uh, that's why I took such an interest in it, and that's why I continue to get it. <laughs> Any comments, Anne, on the first governorship, the second governorship? Well, I wasn't the around for the, 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 the first. But I, I don't think Jerry does give himself enough credit because he is someone 
who, it wasn't just, oh, everyone was talking about the environment, and so I started talking about it. I do think he has a unique ability to understand uh, issues and see them before other people do. And the satellite was along those lines, that if we had done that back then, it would have been a, a, a great thing, and they called you Governor Moonbeam. But you stay, you read so much, you know so much, and you uh, think always about you know, the next 10 years, the next 20 years, and uh, so I, I, I think you're rare in that sense, that you're so able to govern a state and react to what's happening, but to always think beyond, and I think you, I think then, as a, as a young governor, you really were uh, thinking far ahead of what other people were, and I think a lot of the policies you put in place made California now, why we're so much better on efficiency standards, appliances, all these things are laws that you helped put into place. So um, it wasn't just you were going with the flow. I do think you think ahead. No, but things happen. For example, um, <laughs> he doesn't want to take any, the, the, the Republicans, you know, uh, Reagan, the Republicans wanted to build a lot of nuclear power plants and they couldn't get them cited. So they wanted a one stop shop. And so uh, Reagan created this as governor, an energy commission. Uh, no, no, he didn't. The legislature put it on his desk. He vetoed it once or twice. Then we had the Arab oil embargo. It became a big issue, and Reagan said, okay, we've got to do something. So, but then the legislature created not just what Reagan wanted, but an energy and resource conservation commission that had a lot of power to cite power plants and to emphasize appliance efficiency standards and building standards and a lot of other things. So uh, he signed the bill. But it didn't go into effect till I was sworn into office on January of 1975. So I appointed the first person that, and built up that whole energy commission. Um, and that's good. And the same thing with the Air Resources Board. It began to get more aggressive uh, when I got there. Uh, but all this stuff, it's building blocks. And I do, I do take them a little further than some might. Uh, some people even think they wonder about that. Um, <laughs> by the way, I was just thinking of my my 1980 presidential three points. So I think since no, none of you remember it, I'm going to repeat them to you. <laughs> they are protect the earth, explore the universe, and serve the people. I thought those were three, <laughs> three good little points. So this may be a little bit of a sensitive question. Gavin Newsom, yeah. high-speed rail, the water plan, the tunnels. How is the current governor behaving towards your important projects? What's, what's going on here? Well, I'm going to tell you what's going on. <laughs> the first thing... You are? Past governors don't really comment on current governors. That's okay. kind of a, a thing we handle. And I want to say something about high-speed rail. China has built 5,000 miles of high-speed rail. We've got, you know, we're still working on our first 100. Uh, this is not a California problem. This is an American challenge. And we want to be, if not the major power, certainly right up there at the top. And uh, China is committing itself to thousands of miles of high-speed rail. So if you can have any kind of a green deal, new or otherwise, you've got to have a big rail program for freight, for people, high speed, regular speed, subways, California, New York, Washington, that is where the future is. If you look at the traffic, it's bumper to bumper, it's gonna get worse, and we're not gonna expand the freeways. We've gotta get off oil. We gotta be zero carbon in the next 20 to 25 years. Well, you, how are you gonna fly those airplanes? You gotta reduce their number. That means you need trains. Trains so, that run on clean energy. On all, they're no, all, all on the renewable reality. energy. It's uh, all renewable all energy. All electricity. Right. Like we're gonna do Caltrain. Caltrain, we got the two billion. Pretty soon it's gonna go faster, cleaner, all renewable energy, and very quiet. So that, you know, that's an idea that America has to belly up to the bar. Otherwise, we're not real. Now, uh, we have in Washington now, uh, a plan, which I totally object to, where you want to r protect the carbon, uh, the fossil fuel engine, the, c the combustion engine. China, on the other hand, is becoming the leader in the production of batteries and electric cars. If we don't watch it, we'll be bailing out the coal industry, and in five to seven years, the electric car will be the standard, and they'll all be Chinese. So just from a point of view of national um, uh, positioning, uh, we have to deal with high-speed rail, with alternative energy, with battery, 
uh, with all the other new technologies that require investment, first by government, most of all by the private sector. And it has to be that collaboration. So that's what I think about that. As far as the water, um, you know, two tunnels, one tunnel, uh, it's all how much water you want. I can tell you this, that those 100-year-old levees that are protecting, you, know, you have levees that keep out the bay, the salt water, as the water comes down to the farms. By the way, it's not just Southern California. 40% uh, of Santa Clara water district comes from the Delta, comes through the Pat Brown Aqueduct. Okay, that's where it comes from. Uh, the city of Livermore gets 85% of their water from the Delta. Now, the Delta is this place near Stockton in that general area, and this fresh water comes from the Sacramento River, comes along, and then gets into the pipe that my father built, okay? Uh, but the water is protected before it gets in the pipe, before it leaves Sacramento River, by a bunch of old dirt levees. We're going to get sea level rise, or we're going to get an earthquake, and they're going to fail. And when they fail and the salt water pours in, Santa Clara is not going to have enough water. Silicon Valley is not going to have enough water. Nor is Livermore. Nor are the farms of California. Nor is Los Angeles, Orange County. It will be a $500 billion catastrophe. So what I'm talking about here is insurance. Like it or not, someday you're going to have to get it done. Or we're in trouble. Or unless you want to go backwards. I mean, you know, we can go back to the Indian times. We had 300,000 people living there. But we got 40 million. And the only way you can live with 40 million is with design and technology and efficiency and elegance. And that's the purpose that I think of, whether it's high speed rail or the water project that would channel water uh, unthreatened uh, by sea because you're not depending on old levees that have to break. So, Anne, do you have thoughts about urgent problems facing California and how, you, how to approach them? Well, uh, I think. I think there are a lot of urgent problems facing not just California, but all of us. I think climate change, obviously, is one of the most profound and, and depressing to think about how little any of us are doing about it. I think California has done the most, by far, uh, and thanks to Jerry, but thanks to a lot of people here. And I think, uh, but nationally, we're nowhere near where we need to be. And I think it will start, it already has come to roost in terms of, you know, the, the extreme weather events we're having and all of that. So I, I think we need to continue that uh, full on, on being leaders in that and pushing uh, the nation uh, to follow, because California obviously just can't do it. We can't just do it here in California and protect ourselves. We're the, the, the victim of, of everything. But something more boring uh, that Jerry alluded to, but I do think it will be a big issue facing California, is, and that Jerry did a great job on, is managing the budget. Uh, and it is boring. No one wants to talk about just, but he came in, there was a huge deficit. Uh, how we manage out of it. It took a, a, a couple years, and he was extremely good that after we got it in balance to get a rainy day fund, to keep, to, to, to get, a, you know, something so that when the downturn happens, which it will, uh, that we're just not in the same spot. And do, so I do worry about that. He vetoed a lot of like he said, goodies from the legislature that sound good, but that didn't have a way over the long term to pay for themselves. Uh, and that is the danger I see, that in the exuberance of doing things that sound good, but with no income stream over the long term, we will go exactly to what we did before, which is we'll hit a recession, we have, we'll have committed to a lot of these things, we will have to cut them all, uh, which is worse for people to become to rely on a program and then it's cut out from them. Uh, and I just worry and think that is a likely scenario in the next you know, couple I of years. I think it's interesting. If you look at Europe <clears throat> and other parts of the world, uh, the Social Democrats were in charge in England, in Germany, in Italy, and uh, Spain. They're there right now by, the, by a thread. But they're mostly uh, right of center governments even though they're more progressive than our right of center government. And so <clears throat> you, you embark upon a lot of these programs that will mitigate uh, inequality, but then at some point people say, well, wait a minute. And then they start putting in conservatives, like Margaret Thatcher, uh, like uh, Merkel, who's not all that conservative, uh, or like some of the other uh, people, well, the guy in the Philippines, the guy in Brazil. So th this politics is not like it's all you can get the truth and just go for it. 
uh, we have, we're governing people, and people are diverse. We always hear about diversity. Well, there's a diversity of thoughts and identities and values. And in a democracy, we have to so accommodate the differences that we maintain stability and harmony and giving everybody a sense that they're part of it and they can find their way. But you can't just take an idea and try to shove it down their throat unless you have a dictatorship and that doesn't work either. So uh, that's where we are. We, you gotta persuade. And uh, persuading people that, uh, you know, do a tax, I've done that. I've persuaded people to do uh, the income tax uh, and we've persuaded people uh, to do, to validate the gas tax. But how many times can you do that? Uh, you know, I wouldn't press my luck too far. So I, I grant you there are these affordability and health and this and that, all sorts of problems. Uh, but uh, you got to take them on, I think, in a pretty practical, uh, empirical way that uh, is, well, you know, it can be visionary, but I like to say you got to keep, keep your head in the stars, eyes on the stars, but your feet on the ground and see how you can work the two extremes. Let's talk about your life post-governorship, how you're living, where you're living. So there's this ranch, and it goes deeply back into Jerry's family. Tell us a little bit about your great-grandfather, the ranch, and what you're creating at the ranch. Well, I never knew my great-grandfather. He died in 1907, <clears throat> two years after my father was born. And he came from Germany in 1852, across the plains, and found his way uh, up to Calusa, the story is, is it was flooding. Sacramento had a big flood in the 60s, and he got himself up to Calusa and got a ranch, and um, that's where my grandmother was born in 1878. So when I was a little boy, my grandmother would tell me about the mountain house and how exciting it was for her, because this is 14 miles uh, from the railroad or from what is now I-5, and people would come by they'd get fresh horses, they'd stay all night, it was a little hotel. And uh, so I always, I, I knew about that. It was kind of a magical idea in the place. And I forgot about it for a while. But then when my grandmother's uh, brother died in 1959, I was in the seminary, so I didn't know about it. But my father and his brother bought the ranch at the, uh, at the estate sale from uh, my grandmother's brother, that was Frank Shuckman. So they just had it and uh, our neighbors were running cows on it for 50 years. Everything fell apart. The mountain house was burned down by an, ar the hotel was burned down by an arsonist. The black shop, black, uh, uh, black stop, uh, Smith. blacksmith shop kind of, that went by the wayside. The barns had graffiti all over them. Um, it was just left there. But the nice part was it was preserved. And the only things that were there were coyotes, wild boar, and the neighbor's cows. And, um, <laughs> So they kept it for me. And uh, so then I figured out, uh, this is where I, oh, one other thing. I remember talking to my uncle. He was a co-owner with my father. And uh, that was my uncle Harold. And Harold said, I was talking to him once, he said, you know, I made a mistake. I should have never been a judge. I should have never been a lawyer. I should have been a farmer. So I wasn't ready to be a farmer. <laughs> but between my grandmother telling me about how wonderful the mountain house was, and my uncle saying, I, I should have been a farmer, I figured, you know, Maybe this is for me. So that's where I really got the idea. And I've been planning this for a long, long time. So finally, we now got a house. And if you look at that book there, you'll see a picture of my great-grandfather with his big beard there. And the mountain behind it is the mountain right in front of our living room now. So I feel I'm walking in the footsteps mm -hmm. of my forebears. And that's a thought that, um, you know, what? it's a very nice thought. And it's also a thought um, the, the pioneering spirit that you know, they didn't have. We got our lithium ion batteries and our solar collectors, and we got a well and all sorts of things. And, par and uh, um, FedEx delivers. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and they do. So mm -hmm. UPS. And UPS. By the way, when they deliver, they stop and they talk, so it's very nice. They do. And the they postman do. delivers, too. Yeah. So it's a lot easier, much tougher. And those people were tough, physical labor, and I like to... And the people in the neighborhood, they're all, you know, they're fixing fences, they're chasing cows, uh, they're doing stuff, and it's all more physical. So it's another world that I find very inspiring and very grounded. This is, the, and, and to try to take care of the land, because a lot of the land is, the soil is um, very dead in many ways. It doesn't 
it hasn't been properly taken care of. So restoring healthy soils, uh, making sure that we're ready for forest fires. We've now got an olive, we've got 120 olive trees. We had our first harvest two years ago. That's pretty interesting. You know, you gotta learn when to pick them, how much water they need. Um, so, I mean, it's in it, it, it has a past, but also has a future, because we're in the middle of the effects of climate change. And it could well be that in 10 or 15 years, the place is unlivable, it may just burn up, kind of like the Oakland Hills. You know, because if this, if this climate is serious business, and you get a 5, 10, 15 year drought, and the temperatures as they are, we're on track now uh, to have massive forest fires, much worse than we have today, unless we can make the turn. So I'm trying to figure, trying to uh, work with the soils and, and uh, in this particular ranch, it's a, it's a concrete. So it's not a big abstract idea. This is a real place with a real history and I'm building a real future in. So that's why I like to go from the concrete to the more general. And the more general, of course, is how are we gonna get along with nature? Uh, because we're not on very good terms with nature right now and nature's gonna snap back and there's gonna be a lot of suffering if we don't wake up. So, Anne, you are the person who kind of gets things done and keeps the trains on time. I imagine you're very involved in the daily operation of this enterprise. Tell us what it's like, what are your days like, and what are you creating there in terms of living your values? Well, Jerry, Jerry did describe it well. We do have an olive orchard. There's a lot going on at the ranch. There's an olive orchard we're going to be growing. We've just done a house there. We're going to be doing organic gardening. There are cows that are roaming around, you know, uh, that our neighbor has. We don't own any of the cows. We have our two dogs that are running all over the place. Uh, we will be thinking, uh, like he said, of how we have geologists who have come on site who are helping us understand the geology around the hydrology, there the and the hydrology flow. where the water is coming from where it's not coming from uh, and uh, Jerry wants to bring people in to talk about how do we improve the soil all, all of that sort of there's a lot of projects going on there but what I find fascinating being out there is what Jerry said. Um, first of all, we had to provide everything there ourselves. All electricity, that we are not on the grid. There is no PG&E. So we get solar panels, we have our own batteries. There was no public water. We had to find our own water. We have a well. We also collect water from the roof. Everything we provide there, we have to provide for ourselves. So that's a real feeling of, in a way, it, it was daunting when we went out there to kind of just think, garbage, no garbage pickup, no, you know, where do we put the garbage? Compost. It took me a, a few, yeah, we have a composter, we do that, but there's a lot of other garbage, and, you know, I called everyone. There's no, I finally found some local guy who just, I had to think out of the goodness of his heart, will come by once a month to pick up our garbage. Otherwise, So, I mean, literally, there's just nothing like the normal services that you would think of. There is, however, he's right, FedEx and the postman comes, and what I would say, the, so I would say, I, I think we're living there, the culture that is so different from living in a city, and the people out there, I understand now what it means to be sort of out in the country and how people feel and what they think, because they've always had to provide so much for themselves. And they also care a lot more and think more about their neighbors. We get people who stop by our house. It's a very different uh, sort of traditions out there. People just stop by unannounced every single day. Every, literally, neighbors, uh, the mailmen, like he said, they talk, you know, I know them by name, LeMay is the UPS driver, Mark is the FedEx, Mark, another Mark is the, and they stop and they chat, and then people from town just stop, you know, they bring you a little gift or they, this, so every day we have someone just coming by, checking in, how are things going? So it's a really different feeling out there uh, and you always learn so much about what's happening. They ask you about this, or uh, we're learning about the birds, we're learning about trees, we have olive experts coming out. Uh, we got are learning about the rattlesnakes. We got oh, learn. yeah, the rattle rattlesnakes. rattlesnakes. Also, the mountain house is a very special place, and um, people uh, in Calusa County, many of them have visited right. as kids. Uh, I have a cousin, uh, cousin that's a granddaughter of my grandmother's sister, uh, my, my grandmother had uh, seven siblings. 
And um, so there are people from all the, her sisters and brothers, that as they go down the generations, they're still around. They all know about the mountain house, and they all have visited, and they've come back, and they, we've had encampments. And just the other day, uh, one of the descendants of uh, Charlie Shockman, which was my grandmother's brother, uh, they just called at 8 o'clock and said, hey, we're at the Sacramento airport. Uh, you mind if we stop in? So they stop in. and uh, At 7.30 in the morning. Yeah, they called. And, they uh, texted you, and you texted me in bed. We yeah. were in bed together. My yeah. husband and I do sleep together. <laughs> and I got a text at well, 7.30 wanted... in the morning, and I... Well, I it's thought you were Jerry asleep. Saying, I thought you were oh, asleep. Oh, so-and-so is coming by in 15 minutes. I'm like, uh, uh, hello. I'm in... Anyway, so, well, what's yeah, interesting is this person's... <laughs> Mother uh, had, had come there as a child. Uh -huh. Her mother's now died. She lived to about 90, and she'd come there just a few years ago. And she liked the screen porch, which the mountain house had. And we have a screen porch. So her daughter was ta talking about that. So there's a mythic quality here uh, to the land. And also, I like it, when we got married, we had the Bible that uh, Anne's parents had. And her grandfather was a minister. I think, right? My great-grandfather. Your great-grandfather. Your great -grandfather. Anyway, the inscription of the Bible said, look to the mountains. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing. We're looking to the mountains. <laughs> From whence cometh my hope. What? <laughs> so we're, there's so much we could talk about here. And we're getting to the point where we need to wrap it up. We've been having a debate in this country, primarily over our, um, our representatives, Nancy Pelosi and yeah. Dianne Feinstein about whether folks should lay down the torch and give way to younger people to take political leadership. We have so many examples. You are a prime example of uh, experienced leaders working even more effectively in their seventh, eighth, and ninth decades to bring about political leadership and change. So. What do you, how do you see your wisdom and capabilities having grown? And what do you think about this question of the older you generation? Have an old one or a young one? Is that the idea? Uh, well, what about this debate we've been having? Well, I don't think Feinstein's too old to be senator. OK. <laughs> I don't. And you certainly weren't too old to be governor. Look, you get older, you get more rigid. And you, some of your ideas are a bit outdated. But you also know a hell of a lot. And you have a lot of relationships. And Diane is very effective. For California, and she is a person who's focused, and she can get stuff done, and um, you know, so fine. Pelosi, um, she's a younger one. That she's <laughs> only in her seven. She's a young thing. She's yeah. two years younger than me. Uh, Man, I went by to visit them. Uh, I brought by Sam Nunn and Bill Perry to talk about the threat of nuclear blunder. And that the, the, the House should be doing something. Congress has to do more, and we should be meeting with the Russian uh, Duma, and we need much more dialogue to stop the madness of unlimited nuclear proliferation and building. So uh, Pelosi was very aware, very on, on the whole topic. I think uh, she's good. She, <laughs> now, when you say step aside, I mean, this is not the business we have. If, you, if somebody can beat them, go ahead. Um, but so far, She's prevailed. And so, look, this, Doug Chaoping was pretty old. He did a pretty good job. <laughs> Conrad Audenar is pretty, I don't know how old, he's pretty old. He's older than most of these characters that are running. Um, so, and De Gaulle, how old was he? So, it, 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 I think you can't say. Old has virtues, but it has infirmities. Uh, young has exuberance and uh, courage and risk-taking, uh, but you know, lacking in, in the seasoned eye that is needed at this time when we're at uh, a maximum danger. We have a danger of nuclear blunder. We have the uh, growing climate threat. We have the growing financial uh, instability and global integration. Who knows? And then the polarization and so much t tearing us apart. So I don't think old and young uh, is quite... Uh, the issue, you know, there were times when older people were given a little more respect. <laughs> I must say that. You know, the tribal elders, you wouldn't think of saying, hey, the, hasn't this chief been around long enough? It did, didn't work that way. The tribal elders, in fact, you didn't even have, have the chief, you had the older people uh, in, the, in the tribe. Well, 
you know, I think Diane and Nancy and myself, we can handle things pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, we'd all agree with that. So I want to thank you so much, not only for being with us tonight, and Gus Brown and Jerry Brown, but for both of your service for so many years, for the state, for the nation, and really for globally on some very important issues. So thank you for all you've done, and again, thank you for being with us this evening. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We're done. Well, I guess so. I guess we're done. Oh. What do we do? Say down? No, just, oh, I gotta wait for her to, oh. Uh -huh. I think you have a standing ovation. Please. Yeah. So this, uh, with thanks to all of our audience, this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California is now adjourned.